This is a 2012 Mitsubishi i Miev, and it, well, it looks like an egg. Like an egg had a baby with a golf cart. That is the i Miev. Although this is no golf cart, it's an actual electric car made by Mitsubishi that came out about 10 years ago to compete with the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Volt, except nobody bought it. Today, we're going to find out why, and I'm going to show you all of the crazy quirks and features of the Mitsubishi i Miev. Before I get started, big news, this Mitsubishi i Miev is currently for sale, being auctioned live on cars and bids. Yes, that's right, the i Miev. Most people don't remember it, and those who do remember it only as a joke. But it can be yours on cars and bids. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this i Miev, where you can bid on it and buy it with no reserve, only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the very quirky and not very featurey i Miev. And I want to start with a general overview of what this is. Specifically, I want to underscore that despite its appearance, the i Miev was not some golf cart, not a low-speed vehicle you were intended to drive around your retirement community. This was an actual electric car that you were supposed to do actual car things things with. Take it to the grocery store, take it on the freeway. It was an early electric vehicle rival to other early modern EVs like the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, those types of cars, except the i Miev was first. This was the first modern production electric vehicle. It came out in Japan in late 2009, and it came to the United States a couple of years later, late 2011, as a 2012 model. It was was the beginning of the EV revolution. But even though the i Miev was first, it was certainly not best. Even by early EV standards of 15 years ago, the numbers didn't look good. When it was new, the EPA rated the i Miev at 62 miles of range between charges. It also had only 66 horsepower. Zero to 60 came in 13 seconds, and it topped out around 81 miles an hour. Enough for highway speed but just and then there was the styling. The i Miev looks like an egg. Really, like I said earlier, like an egg and a golf cart had a love child, and it came out with a Mitsubishi logo on the front. I, I am filming this video in a parking lot. Someone came up to me a second ago and said, what is this thing? And I explained it, and they said, that is the ugliest car I have ever seen. That person has clearly never seen an original Aston Martin Lagonda, but the point stands it was not an attractive vehicle. Now, the i Miev was based on a gasoline-powered Mitsubishi K car that was sold in Japan since 2006. In Japan, K cars, a government regulation size class to try to incentivize automakers to make tiny space-maximizing vehicles for crowded cities. And that's why the i Miev looks like this. But needless to say, it doesn't translate well to American roads, or roads anywhere else, <laughs> frankly. But anyway, next let's move on to the other quirks of the i Miev, because even though this was a very early egg-shaped EV with ridiculously awful performance, the quirks only begin there. They continue with the key, which looks like a fairly standard Mitsubishi key lock-unlock button, but it's attached to this, which turns out to be a remote that you use by putting up the antenna manually and then pointing it at the car. This can direct the car's charge times. You turn on the remote, as you can see I've done, and then you can use these silver buttons to tell the car when to start charging. So like if electricity in your area is cheaper at night, you can say, hey, don't charge for four hours, start charging then to take advantage of the lower electricity rates. And then you would press a button on the side of this remote and it would transmit this information to the car, but only if you had your antenna up. 
And that's how you dealt with charging instructions for the iMiev. Once you've unlocked the car, open the door, and you discover the door panel is fairly standard. It uses one giant circle to kind of include everything. An armrest, window switches, a door storage pocket. It's kind of a cute design, but nothing particularly interesting there. You get inside, though, and you start to see that this car doesn't really have... Well, a lot of features. The first thing you see to the left of the steering wheel is a lot of blank switches. Quite a few items over here that, well, you just don't get. Then you look at the seats and you see padding and contours weren't really a priority. The seat bottom in particular is basically just flat. This isn't exactly a supportive, comforting, hug you in place car seat. It was a chair that you would sit on to drive your iMiev, nothing more. The iMiev also didn't have central cup holders, although it did have individual cup holders for driver and passenger. To the left of the steering wheel, this little plastic panel, you pull it down, that's your cup holder. Strangely enough, it's square. <laughs> Same deal over on the passenger side. Panel here, you pull it down, and you have a square cup holder. Now, you will notice that there is a cup holder between the front seats, but it's positioned far back. That's for the rear seats, and there's only one. So rear seat passengers can fight over who gets to use the... <laughs> cup holder. Now, in the center control stack of the iMiev, you have three dials and your climate controls. And frankly, they're fairly straightforward. You do have air conditioning in this car, although using it robs you of a significant amount of range. Check out the range number. I turn on the air conditioning, it drops significantly, and now I'm turning up the air conditioning. I'm turning up the fan, and the range is dropping basically with every twist of the dial to turn the air conditioning higher. Less and less range, corresponding almost one for one, dropping the range as I increase the air conditioning. So you didn't really want to use the climate control that much. In fact, if you got cold, Mitsubishi suggested instead of using the climate controls, you'd use the heated seat. <laughs> There is just one heated driver's seat. The button is under the dashboard on the driver's side. You could turn it on and warm yourself, and that would use less energy than using the climate control system to heat up the interior if you needed to maximize your range. As for your passenger, sorry, you were out of luck. Only one heated seat in this car. But let's go back to that gauge cluster, which you saw a second ago. It looks like Mickey Mouse. You can see a large circle in the middle and then two mouse ears coming off both sides. It really, you can't look at it and not see that. The large circle in the center in the middle shows you your speed, a digital miles per hour speed readout. And then on the edge of that there's a dial that shows like your current use situation. So there's eco if you're driving economically, there's power if you really floor it to make full use of the 66 horses, and then there's also a charge component here too in case you're using regen. So the needle on this dial moves around like a tachometer as you drive around in your iMiev. Now the upper right mouse ear in the gauge cluster shows your range. As you can see in the low 40s right now, not a whole lot of range for the iMiev. The upper left mouse ear shows two things. One is your charge capacity. So you can see this iMiev is almost full, almost completely charged, and it has in the 40s miles of range left. Not exactly great. Now you also have a display here showing what gear you are in. You can see P, R, N, D, and a couple of others, and those are always displayed there. Now the gear selector situation in the iMiev is also rather interesting. For one thing, you have a leather wrapped gear gear lever, which is odd because there is no other leather anywhere in this interior. Everything has been cheaply made, decontented, crappy plastic everywhere you look except the gear lever, which is leather. Who knows why? They shared it from some other vehicle, surely, but it's the only nice thing in here. Now, you can see the usual P, R, N, D in this gear lever, and below that you have Eco. If you put it into Eco, it robs you of a lot of power, and basically ensures that you never go beyond the eco display in your gauge cluster. This is obviously for more economic driving to help maximize your range, but it makes the car feel very underpowered. Below that you have B, which stands for braking, and this drive mode maximizes your regenerative braking. You would use that if you're going down hills and you want to try to capture as much energy back into the battery and power system as possible. That's what
what B is for. Now, interestingly, also in this center area, if you go below the center control stack behind the shift lever, you have a USB port here. You can plug in your device and then play it through the infotainment system, which is surprisingly high tech at the time. In fact, this infotainment screen is actually a touch screen, believe it or not, which really surprises me for a car from the early 2010s, especially a relatively cheap one like this. And if you go to the audio section of this screen, Bluetooth audio is an option that you have, which was just starting to come into luxury cars in the 2011-12 era. Well, you had it in your iMiev. Other than that, this infotainment system, as you can imagine, not exactly great. It's really just a music player and a navigation system. It doesn't really include any other functions, and the displays aren't exactly high quality by modern standards, not especially nice, but it's there for navigation and audio. Disappointingly, if you want to adjust the volume, there's no dial. You just have to tap, 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 tap the volume button up or down. And that's just the way it worked in the iMiev. By the way, one interesting trick of this infotainment system, if you press the open button, the screen will tilt and slide forward, giving you access to a DVD slot where you would insert your navigation DVDs. You remember those days? That's how you did it in the iMiev. When you would put your DVD in, you would press open again, and then it would close right up and go back to its normal position. A little hidden trick of the iMiev infotainment. By the way, two other things worth pointing out in the front seat of this car. For one, headroom is absolutely fantastic. Due to the egg shape, which I have already made fun of mercilessly, you actually benefit greatly from it inside where you have great headroom, even for a taller person like me, no problem at all, despite a pretty small car. Now, the egg shape also makes for an unusual windshield shape, and that means a very strange windshield wiper orientation. You can see one wiper along the bottom like normal, but the other one is climbing up the side. This is the standard resting position for the wipers in the iMiev. And here's what they look like when they're on. Very unusual, very strange, but that's kind of what happens when you have an egg-shaped car and a big flat windshield like this. You gotta do something weird with the wipers to maximize windshield coverage, and Mitsubishi has certainly <laughs> done that. Another weird quirk of the iMiev. And next we move on to the back seat of the iMiev, where once again you will find excellent headroom for such a tiny car, owing to its egg-shaped design, but not such great legroom, as you can can see. I've got the front seat positioned where I would sit and I can't even get my legs down. <laughs> Needless to say, this is a very small car and a very small back seat, as you might expect. Now, in back, once again, you can see there are no frills, no luxury back here, or even an attempt. The seat bottom is, once again, basically flat. No nice contours to help your comfort. It's just a place to sit, a bench back here. That's all you get. And in fact, you only get two rear seats, not a five-seater this car, two in the front, in the back. And to make that point clear, Mitsubishi has installed a plastic panel in the center of the rear seat that says I, this vehicle's logo, and below that you have six dots. And apparently that is supposed to ensure nobody sits here because it isn't actually a seat with a seat belt. And by the way, those six dots are kind of a theme of this car. You see them in the rear door right here, those six dots. You also see them in the front door, the six dots appear again, and you see them in the lights, the headlight has six dots, as you can see, and the taillight also has that six dot pattern. Perhaps each dot is supposed to represent 10 miles of range. I don't know what it means, but that's what they've done. And next up, we move on to the back of the iMiev, the cargo area, which once again isn't particularly interesting. Nothing unusual back here, although it is reasonably sized considering this is such a small car. You got some decent cargo space back here where you can stick stuff in your iMiev. Now, also with the tailgate open, you can see a VIN tag on the bumper. This is very important for assessing iMiev provenance. You can't say you have a numbers matching iMiev unless you have this very important important Vintag. And speaking of iMiev provenance, let's talk about the name for this vehicle. Mitsubishi debuts the i, lowercase i, dash miev in every market, Asia, Japan, Australia, and they call it the iMiev. Well, they bring it to the United States in late 2011, and they decide to just call it the i, 
lowercase i. No Miev, just the Mitsubishi I. That's how they referred to it in all of their press materials, their marketing materials at the time. With only one problem, they still badged it as the I Miev. You can see on the back here, two badges. There's the I and then the Miev, completely separate. They don't even look similar, <laughs> the two badges. They're not at all together, but that's how these cars were badged. And you can see it in the floor mats in the front seats too. I Miev, even though technically Mitsubishi called it the I. This, of course, makes absolutely no sense. It was called the iMiev everywhere else. It was badged as the iMiev, but it was only called the i. And this gives you a little insight into <laughs> the chaos that is Mitsubishi's corporate structure here in North America. Now, also interesting, on the outside of this car, you have two different charge port doors for two different types of chargers, different locations, different shapes. Over on the passenger side, you have this little circular charge port door and over on the driver's side you have a more traditional looks like a fuel door that's for a different size charge port and accessing these charge ports is kind of hilarious the one on the passenger side is pretty easy underneath the dashboard on the driver's side you have this latch which is obviously just a repurposed hood latch you pull that and then the passenger charge port door opens the funnier one is over on the driver's side to access that you look to the left of the driver's seat you have have a latch here to open a fuel door. It even has a fuel icon on it. <laughs> You pull that, and then the driver's side charge port door opens. Now, I mentioned earlier that the iMiev was created by repurposing a gasoline-powered Mitsubishi that already existed. Clearly, they just kept the fuel door latch and the fuel door and didn't even bother to change the image on it. And so, to access your charge port, you pull a latch for the non-existent fuel door. And by the way, speaking of charging, it was predictably, a disaster with this car. Level one charging, so a household outlet took 22 and a half hours to recharge. Level two charging, like what you have for your clothes dryer, that would recharge the car in about seven hours. Now, there was an option that you could get a level three public charger, because people didn't have them in their homes at the time, and that would go from zero to 80% charge in about 30 minutes, which doesn't sound so bad until you remember that 80% charge is only about 50 miles of range back when this car was new. So at home, it took you seven hours on a level two charger to get 62 miles out of this car. Needless to say, it wasn't exactly a road trip vehicle. But anyway, speaking of opening things in this car, moving on from the charge ports and the tailgate, the front compartment does open. There's a latch in the passenger side footwell, obviously a carryover from the fact that this car was developed for right-hand drive, where that would have been in the driver's side footwell. They didn't bother to move it over when converting the car for left-hand drive. So you pull this latch in the passenger side footwell, and you pop open this front compartment to here, and then you can lift it up the rest of the way, and you see there's really nothing up here. No storage compartment, but you do have some mechanical things, some fluids, the regular car battery, and that's what you have in the front of your iMiev. But anyway, since I'm outside the iMiev, let's talk through some more exterior absurdities with this car, starting with the wheels and tires. These wheels, three spokes, four lug nuts, 15 inches, and the front tires are only 145 width, which is just incredibly, incredibly narrow. This car was little. It didn't weigh much. It didn't have much power. Those were all the tires it needed. Now, in back, the iMiev had 175 width tires, significantly wider than the fronts in order to handle the drag strip pulls. When the car would squat back, you wanted more rubber on the ground. <laughs> Actually, it did have wider tires because there was more weight back there. The motor is in the back of this car, electrical components, so it was heavier in back. In fact, this car was rear engine, rear wheel drive, just like a Porsche 911. <laughs> Unlike a 911, it had only 66 horsepower, but it did have a respectable 145 pound-feet of torque, which it's not really that bad. 
No, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's really quite bad. And it sent this car from zero to 60 in 13 seconds, like I mentioned before, which is even more impressively slow considering the IMEF only weighed about 2,550 pounds, incredibly lightweight, and yet still incredibly slow. And interestingly, it was also surprisingly expensive. The base price for a base model IMEF was around $30,000 back in 2012. That still seems like a lot. Even after 10 years of inflation, 30 grand for this thing seems like big money. Although it's worth pointing out that when you factored in tax rebates and obviously discounts from Mitsubishi dealers who were desperate to find people who bought these, transaction prices were probably closer to around $20,000, which what was more reasonable, although still not tremendously reasonable. Worth mentioning though, this was cheap by electric vehicle standards at the time. Back then, the Nissan Leaf was around $6,000 more expensive than this car without significantly more driving range, although it was a much more legitimate looking vehicle. And most people chose the Leaf, I think in part for that reason. Now, as for the iMEV's life on the market here in the US, came out for the 2012 model year, like I mentioned, and it was sold on and off through 2016. I say on and off because they would pile up at dealerships. Nobody would want them. So Mitsubishi would skip a model year. The dealers would sell their inventory and then they would come back and resurge and pile up again. So they skip. I think they skipped the 13 and the 15 15 model year. So it was 12, 14, and 16, but I'm not entirely sure. But that's how the IMEA was sold here in North America. It just wasn't all that popular. Now, interestingly, production of this car continued through 2021 globally. And in Europe, it was even rebadged as a Peugeot and a Citroen, the Peugeot Ion and the Citroen C0. They wanted electric cars. Mitsubishi was already making one. They figured, why not go with them? But here in the United States, this car was almost completely ignored. Nobody wanted it. Nobody bought it. It was <laughs> kind of a laughing stock more than anything. And I'd be surprised if they sold more than maybe 2,000 of these during the production run. It really has become an obscure, weird car for people who like weird cars. And it's not just bad by modern EV standards. Things have come so far. Even at the time, it was heavily criticized. I was doing research for this video to figure out all the facts and figures, and I couldn't help but laugh at some of the reviews Edmunds said about this car when it was new. While the idea of using a small, inexpensive EV for commuting is enticing, we recommend avoiding the iMEV as the means to go about it. <laughs> Consumer Reports said this is the cheapest all-electric car available, but the trade-off is it's slow, clumsy, stiff riding, and Spartan inside. Reviews were not positive. I wonder why. All right, driving the iMEV. Now it's hot in here, and that's because turning on the air conditioning would drop my range by about six miles, and rolling down the window creates sound problems, so I sit here and sweat with 42 miles of range to go, even though I'm mostly fully charged. All right, flooring it here, and wow. When they said this was slow, <laughs> oh, ho. Oh. You think of, it's funny because in the 10 years since this car came out, you now think of electric vehicles as being like quick. Like that's one of their main benefits. It's one of the cool things that people like about them. Here I'm flooring it, 20, 24, 30, 40, 50. <laughs> It ain't fast. In fact, it's quite the opposite. This is one of the slowest vehicles that I've driven in quite some time. And this is with power all the way maxed out in the, in the gauge cluster readout. And I've lost two miles of range driving this way, even though I've only gone probably a thousand feet. Needless to say, this car is not particularly quick. And then there's the other issue, which is the handling. Now, I, I read some reviews of the car from back in the day that said that the steering is pretty lively. Well, it is. But that's because there's no weight at the front end and the car is incredibly tall and narrow. And so by lively, what they really mean to describe the steering is kind of dangerous. Like it's a little unsettled. You got nothing up there, a lot back there, and a tipsy kind of car. Now, the good news is you can't go fast enough to get in any trouble in this vehicle. It'd be very difficult to roll one over, but it's not exactly the feeling you normally get with electric cars where you have all these batteries low that gives it this kind of feeling of being planted on the ground. That's not really what I'm feeling I get here. And going into a corner and kind of giving it some hard turn. 
That also isn't really the best situation. The body lean is significant, like really measurably significant. Like what you get in some, you know, 90s or 80s American boat type cars that slowly go around corners. That's the situation here. It is, whoo hoo. Now the good news is I'm, I'm actually surprised at how little road noise and wind noise there is. I'm not sure if the lack of wind noise is due to the aero, but it is surprisingly quiet in here. You do hear motor and electric noise, which you don't usually hear in most EVs. And there's some tire noise, but not as much as I was expecting. For a crappy little, you know, started its life as a K car vehicle, it's, it's reasonably, quiet in here. Again, this was developed as a K car, which is this Japanese like automotive regulation designed for incentivizing people to buy small cars in very crowded cities. This car was never intended to go, you know, 60 miles an hour on a big wide open American streets, but it does and it doesn't feel right. The good news, the only good news, aside from the fact that it's somewhat quiet in here, is that the cabin is pretty like open and airy. Again, you've got good headroom in here, surprisingly decent legroom in the front. Um, it's like fine. You you can sit in here and it and it works and frankly this car could work as a city commuter vehicle these were cheap when they were new after you factored in discounts and rebates they are cheap by modern standards on the used market they're really really cheap because nobody wanted them new and 12 years later especially nobody wants them and so like if you want just a if you want something slightly more capable than a golf cart that is this <laughs> But it is not much more than that. It has climate control, it has Bluetooth audio, although some golf carts have Bluetooth audio. <laughs> it's fine, it works well, it does what it was advertised to, which is a very early electric car for people who wanted to try out that technology at the very forefront of it. You know, like the original Prius and the original Honda Insight, this is kind of like that. But it isn't what I would call a, a fully formed idea, especially since electric vehicles have come so far in the 12 years since this car first went on sale here in the United States. It's fine, it's a good cheap car, but it really is kind of like an early EV and it shows. And it doesn't look great and it doesn't drive all that well too. <laughs> and so that's the Mitsubishi iMiev. This car actually has one legitimate use, which is it's little, it's cheap, and it doesn't use gas. So it could be a good driver around crowded big cities. Just if you buy it, prepared to be made fun of. <laughs> And now it's time to give the IMBF a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 29 out of 100, ranking the IMBF near the very bottom of every single car I've ever reviewed. Though it still doesn't beat out the awful BMW i Zeta, but it does tie the Yugo, which should tell you exactly how I feel about the IMBF. This is a bad electric car with few redeeming qualities. It has poor range, unattractive styling, few amenities, and very mediocre materials. And the sole benefit is its increasingly cheap price tag. Well, that and the fact that it be kind of cool as a meme car, you got to admit. But when you're in meme car territory, you know it's not something you want to drive every day. And with the iMiev, well, it isn't.